All right. Well, thank you very much. Okay, so here we go. I apologize for the method. Basically, um, I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to correct him. I, I, it's not just about covers. It actually covers uh, stamps and covers uh, this talk, this presentation. So when we talk about Indian states, there's actually uh, two categories. One's called convention states and the others are called feudatory states. Now, the difference being convention states are a group of six states that had a postal agreement with the imperial government, whereby they followed a certain set of rules, postal rules and regulations on issuing stamps and rates and things like that, so that there was some sort of uniformity. These six states, uh, which include Chamba, Faridkot, Gwalior, Jin, Naba, and Patiala, uh, they, their stamps and postal stationery were basically valid anywhere within their own state as well as all throughout Imperial India. Uh, the other group of states that issued stamps are called feudatory states. And basically they had no agreement with the Imperial government. They kind of went about, did their own thing. Most of the time didn't even ask for permission from the imperial government to issue stamps or have their own postal system. In some cases they did, some states didn't bother to. Uh, with the exception of Travancore and, and Cochin, uh, the stamps and postal stationery of these states were only valid within the boundaries of their own respective states. These two states, Cochin and Travancore had an agreement with each other whereby their stamps and postal stationery had validity in each other state. So a total of 39 Indian feudatory states issued postage stamps besides the six convention states. Of these 39 states, 37 are currently recorded and listed in Stanley Gibbons catalog. Uh, Kota and Tonk are not listed in the catalog in Stanley Gibbons. However, we have 38 states listed in Scott catalog Shapura being the only one that's not listed in Scott. Rajkot only issued postal stationery, no stamps. So I know if you go back to my list, uh, there is no mention of Bahalpur. If you look at alphabetically, it starts with Alwar, Bamra. Uh, I consider Bahal Stanley Gibbons list Bahalpur under Pakistan. I, as a collector of Indian states, I consider Bahawalpur to be part of Indian and Indian state because they were issuing stamps in 1933 when they were part of India, well before 1947 when India was uh, partitioned between India and Pakistan. And, and a few months later, Bahawalpur, the Amir or the king of Bahawalpur decided to join Pakistan in late 1947. So therefore I consider this state to be an Indian state. And this is an example of a hand-drawn essay of the very first stamp that was issued by Bahalpur. It's basically a, an alliance between the British and the Bahalpur kingdom. But the stamp was actually ended up being issued in, in black ink on green paper. Here's the first set that is listed in, in, in Stanley Gibbons. This is, was issued right after India, the partition took place and Baharpur was actually an independent kingdom at that time for a few months. And these are the stamps the state issued. Uh, only 20 copies are known of the uh, two rupee, five rupee and 10 rupee denominations. The lower values are somewhat common. These stamps were valid for a very short period of time. Here we have the first stamp that the lowest denomination three pi is used on a cover. Uh, this happens to be one of two known covers. Next, we come to this um, combination cover from Bamra State. Uh, these are, this is the only known combination cover from Bamra State, uh, combination meaning it has imperial postage stamps as well as Bamra State postage stamps. Now, the Bamra State stamps paid postage to the 
Sambalpur post office, exchange post office in Sambalpur. From there upon, it was carried by the imperial post uh, to England. Here we have a BAMRA postcard used with a negative steel cancel. This happens to be the only commercially used postcard and was described by Garrett Adams and in India Post in 1980. Here we have the earliest documented commercially used postal item from BAMRA state. This also appeared in an article in India Post in 2010. Um, this happens to be ex Haberbeck, who was a very famous collector of Indian states, uh, lived in the United States. Again, this is, has a combination. It has imperial stamp as well because the Bamra postal stationery paid postage was only valid till to um, make to have this envelope reach the imperial exchange office in Sambalpur and there. From there on, it was forwarded to Calcutta by the Imperial Post. So it was handled by two different postal systems. Next, we come to Barwani. Um, it's interesting, in the Kovre sale, Kovre was uh, a, a considered a crazy Frenchman collector whose motto was anything he wanted. He, when he collected Indian states, um, anything that he needed for his collection, he would tell his agent to add just an extra zero to the bid. He was just an absolute crazy collector. This postcard happened to be the highest realizing single item in his sale when his Indian states were sold off at, at, at the auction. Here we have the uh, unique example of the Dashel number C3 postcard message and reply portion attached. Next, we have a used copy of the um, Dashel number C3, also ex -Covre, and it's the only known example. Now we move to Bhopal. Uh, you must have heard of Bhopal because it had that uh, Union Carbide big um, blow up uh, where people, a lot of people were injured uh, a couple of decades ago. So this is, Bhopal used a very, very primitive uh, method of perforating the sheets. Uh, they basically had a nail bed and they would hammer it down onto the sheet, the whole bed. A bed imagine a bed of nails. So this, in this instance, uh, I think the nails fell off and have resulted in a really spectacular error. You have a strip of vertical strip of four with imperf between uh, two of them. And then you have a vertical strip of three imperf between uh, two of them. This also is unique. It's not, this error is not listed in the catalog yet. So, the latest stamps of Bhopal were printed by Perkins Bacon. And um, Perkins Bacon had a policy of retaining one sheet uh, for the archives and they would perforate its specimen across. This happens to be the unique sheet uh, with perforated specimen across multiple times. Here we have a very interesting error. This is uh, not listed yet. Uh, it has an RPSL third. Instead of three, it says T-H-E-E. -E. The R is missing. Here we have another error. It's T-H-R-F-E instead of E-E. -E. So F instead of E on the left stamp. Um, this is a BPS third as well. Next, we have uh, where the pies, the word pies, the denomination is, uh, is uh, omitted. Not yet listed in, in the catalog. Now we have on the left side, we have P1FS instead of PIES. So there's a one instead of an I and F instead of an E. 
in pies and P I S E instead of P I E S. So transposed S and E both happen to be in, in the same block. Now we come to the state of Bundi. This is the first stamp issued by Bundi. It's SG1. It's um, quite rare. Perhaps three or four of them exist on cover. And here's the unused example. Uh, one of three recorded examples of the SG1 of Bundi. Here we have a really interesting cover. It's a registered cover. The registered covers from this early period, they're called the dagger period, are exceptionally rare. The only covers you really come across are single weight, ordinary letters, Frank with half Anna. Um, this is on the left, the stamp on the left, the green stamp. It actually has the uh, first two characters omitted on the bottom line on the denomination where the denomination is. And it's um, certainly a unique cover. This is a recent discovery that I made. Um, I bought a very old timers collection. And in there was the sheet of the four rupees with the Bundi service hand stamp. Um, this, bund this, stamp, this particular stamp, this printing is not known with the official overprint. So hopefully someday it'll get a catalog status. Here we have a very interesting error. Now this happens to be from Chamba, the convention states that we talked about. The second stamp from the left, you notice uh, it says C-H-M-A-B-A instead of C-H-A-M-B-A. So the letters have been transposed. Now we come to Cherkari. Now there was a shortage of the half an hour stamps. Uh, at one point it was suggested to uh, surcharge them in manuscript, but um, only one sheet was done, so, but it was never issued. So it's, um, it's an essay status. Here we have color trials uh, of the one pice more from Cherkari. With the issued colors on both sides, uh, the left and the right, and the middle one is the, uh, is the uh, color trial. Uh, believed to be the only known example in this color. And here we have another color trial of the same denomination in red, also believed to be the unique example. <laughs> here we have the uh, half on a red brown on late paper and again, this is not recorded as of yet. This is Dashiell number C3B. Uh, it's an exceptionally rare postcard in rose color. Uh, what you normally find is in the purple color, uh, magenta. Uh, not even magenta, it's actually really purple is the color that is issued. But the very first issues were made in pink. Uh, this happens to be one of two used examples recorded by Deschel. Here we have a one on a postal stationery envelope of Charkari, but it's plural on us with an S at the end instead of on uh, The very first stamps and stationery of Charkari were issued with the plural uh, rather than singular. Um, and this happens to be printed double. So it's one of two known examples with a double O print of the indicium. I might be stretching it, but this is really the only known registered cover of the Charkari one Anna issue that I'm aware of. It's quite possible that there's another one out there, perhaps. I've just never seen it in my 35 years of collecting Indian states stationery. Oops. Next we come to Cochin State. Uh, this happens to be uh, the Tuputan 
vertical pair and it's completely imperfect. It's not yet recorded in any catalog. Here we have the one putan from the same series uh, printed on both sides. Uh, it's also unrecorded. Next, we have a from the same series of, of stamps, the one putan, but printed double. Again, previously unrecorded. Uh, This happens to be the rarest Indian states stamp in my possession, in my opinion. It's the only known example of this mint stamp. Uh, uh, about 10 used copies are known, but Stanley Gibbons has a dagger next to the mint column indicating that no mint copies are known. It's ironic because it has a BPS certificate. Now we move on to a state name called Dhar. Uh, this is the unique example where the stamp is printed on both sides. What you see the little black oval on the left, on the sheet on the left-hand side, that's the front. Uh, stamps, these are basically security seal markings. So before they were issued, the stamps would have this oval security stamped on them to validate them. Here we have the only known Ted Batch sheet uh, from the first issue of DAR. And here we have two horizontal Ted Batches, also the only two known examples. I've done a, a very detailed study of this typeset issue, the first issue of DAR and I have a five frame exhibit on this. <clears throat> this arrangement of the uh, ornaments is not with the gap. If you notice, there's a quite a decent amount of gap between the corner ornament and the one on the left. That setting is not known. Uh, it's not been recorded. So it's a new discovery. Unfortunately, that's all I have. So I cannot reconstruct the whole setting, which comprise of 10 stamps. Uh, this happens to be a registered cover, which is of the first and the second issue combined, which is also mighty rare. And here we have a registered cover from the second issue. But what's really interesting about this, uh, this Tuana stamp is not known used on a cover to begin with, this on the right-hand side. But uh, this one has um, on the top right here, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but on the top, uh, the ornament is actually has been transposed with the character that goes over here. And uh, it happens once in a sheet of 10. This obviously is the only known example of the stamp used on cover. And it has that tran transposed characters. Sandeep, just to interrupt, I, we can't see your cursor. At least I can. Just oh, you cannot. Okay, so I, okay. All right, so I'll, I'll continue to describe it. Uh, now we come to the postal, st the, uh, the half anna postal stationery envelope of DAR. This envelope is not recorded in any catalog uh, in this size. It's a much larger size than the issued example, which was uh, much smaller. I'll get you the exact dimensions, but this happens to be 152 millimeters by 85 millimeters. Uh, this is, there's, I've recorded three examples, three such examples. And here's the used example of this cover. Now, what's really interesting is um, this is one of two known. And what's really interesting is both of them are addressed to the same person. And what makes it even more interesting is you see a boxed postage due one Anna. What happened with this cover was this was addressed to a, to a person within the state of Dar. But if you notice in red ink, it's written manuscript gone to Baswara. Uh, so he had actually moved to Baswara, which is in Imperial India. So this letter had to be handed over to the Imperial Post. And since Dar stamps and postal stationery had no validity outside the state boundaries, the Imperial government carried it 
and charged the recipient twice the deficiency. So half ended up being the rate uh, because it was not franked. Uh, the recipient ended up having to pay one anna for postage due. Now we come to the state of Dungarpur. Uh, these three stamps, the mint stamps of the first issue are mighty, mighty rare. Um, I have to make this correction. The one on the left, it's not one of, yeah, it is one of two known. I thought I was reading only known. It is one of two known. Um, it belonged to a friend of mine in, in the UK and uh, I had to give up my, quite a bit to have, it was actually a pair, a horizontal pair. And I convinced him to split it up so I could have one because his collection is going to be donated to the British Museum. So the other copy will end up in the British Museum at some point, and this will be the only known example in private hands. The middle stamp also is one of two known. <clears throat> Our good friend, um, is Perry Goldberg, who's a member of the Collectors Club of Chicago, he has the other copy. And the two Annas is one of four. Actually, it's one of five now. One more copy has been discovered. So I believe it's one of five known. Here we have a very interesting cover from Dungarpur. It's the only known cover, but the earliest known cancel, which is this intaglio triangular strike. And it's got the first stamp of uh, Dungarpur, the quarter on a yellow on the right and the one anna on the on the left. Here we have a beautiful three color franking of Dungapur. Um, I believe maybe three, possibly another one might be out there, but so far I've recorded three, three color frank covers of the first issue of Dungapur. Here we have uh, the second issue of Dungapur. And um, these are the only known mint strips, multiples of this issue. Next, we come to Datia. Datia. This is um, SG2, which is two Anna's, is the second stamp uh, of Datia. And here we have the one Anna stamp printed double. I, have, I am not aware of another example. Here we have an interesting sheet. If you notice, it's the, the stamps are vertically tad bashed to each other, uh, creating eight vertical tad bashed pairs. Same thing over here. Now we have eight vertical tad bashed pairs of the one Anna stamp. And here we have four horizontal Ted Batch pairs of the half Anna stamp. There was a shortage of uh, the one Anna stamp um, and for a very short period of just a few months in 1908, the state allowed the use of the fiscal stamp, the blue stamp on top you see is then actually a, a revenue stamp. Uh, so the state allowed it just for a matter of a few months, um, the usage of the one on a revenue stamp for postal purposes. So uh, this, this happens to be ex Fritz Stahl. Fritz Stahl uh, was, was is the person who wrote the book on Jammu and Kashmir. He lived in Berkeley, amazing man, my mentor. <coughs> Here we have, well, it's, I know, unfortunately, it's hard to, sh to see the error um, on a, from a scan. You have to actually hold it at, in the light at an angle to see that it's, there's two impressions. One of them is an albino impression. Datia State had a really unusual postal system I've discovered, and that is they actually allowed the usage of imperial stamps and uh, towards state postage. Um, I, 
I really am baffled as to why and how that happened because that would be an accounting nightmare. But uh, here, as you can see very clearly, I have three, three such covers where the stamp is, the imperial stamp is actually paying for state postage because the cover never traveled outside the state postal system. It was never handled by the imperial postal system. And this cover happens to be just that. Uh, this was uh, delivered, it's a registered large cover sent within the state of Dar, handled by the state postal system. And yet it has, it's frank with multiple copies of imperial stamps. Here we have the uh, Fred Court, again, another convention state where this word service was printed or overprinted on top, but that is completely, um, it's an albino print. This happens to be the discovery copy. Here's the next convention state, Gwalior. Um, this has the issued, issued postal station had the uh, snake emblem, much, much smaller. This is what we call large sun. Uh, this is, happens to be one of four known examples. Same thing with the envelope, the large sun, uh, also one of four recorded examples. What's really interesting, if you go back to this one, you see how the word, uh, it's in English and, and Devnagri, it says Gwalior. It's missing from this. So only the bottom overprint is there, but the, the words Gwalior in Hindi and English are missing. Again, happens to be the only known example. Here we have uh, something very interesting where the, uh, the snake and the sun is printed double, also unique. And here we have an essay without the coat of arms. These are called IPNs or Indian Postal Notes. Um, this happens to be one of three in private hands. There's one in the, in the one was in the, um, my goodness, I'm banking on the name. It's, it's in the um, British Museum, I believe. This is a set of um, specimen stamps. Um, Ex Terry Sturden, who happened to be a, one of the greatest Indian states collectors uh, that lived in the UK, passed away some 20 years ago. Here's another interesting era where the word Qualier is not printed on the right hand stamp, um, the only known example. This has the era where the middle stamp on the left hand side, the mint. Stamp, if you notice very carefully, it's a C instead of an O. Um, it's quite a famous error. It's Gwalis C instead of or no, Gwalisar. And uh, so there's 11 mint copies have been recorded. And it, the one, the used block on the right hand side, which has the error on the top left corner, is the only known used copy. Uh, the very last printing. Uh, took place right about 1947, right before India got uh, became independent, um, was printed locally. Um, these are quite scarce to rare stamps, and this happens to be the largest null multiple of the highest denomination from that series. Here again, we have the Gwali Sir C instead of an O error. And if you notice, if you look very carefully, it's not just a printing error. It's actually the, the font is wrong because there is a serif on the top of the C. Um, so there's 15 mint examples recorded and the only used example in private hands. Uh, the fourth Devnagri character is missing. Uh, believed to be one of two mint copies in private hands. The reason I write down private hands sometimes is because uh, there's another copy in the, um, in the museum. 
and and in some cases there are in, when it comes to convention states only um, there is a possibility that one of these might be in the queen's collection here we have where the characters are now transposed if you look at the top left stamp the Devnagri word on the bottom line reads Sir Siv instead of Sir Vis. So the W and the Sir have been transposed. Again, uh, this is one of 11 mint copies in private hands and the unique used copy in private hands. Now we come to Indore. Uh, this is a really a fabulous cover. It's a um, it's got 14 examples of SG-1, but this was accidentally posted. So in all these, in most of these curatory states, by the way, let me know, you know, I may be going on for longer than you want me to. So let me know when you want me to stop and I can just stop and then it can, there can be a part two. So this- no. Sandeep, yes, I have eight fifteen. So you have a, as much as forty five more minutes if you want them. Oh, okay, all right, wonderful. I'll keep going and just you know, if I get carried away, just just tell me. Let okay. me know. Okay. So this this cover happens to be um, most. Let, let me go back a step. Most Indian states, most Indian feudatory states, the imperial they had their own postal system. These thirty eight states that we talked about, these 38 feudatory states, they had their own postal system. So they had mailboxes and letterboxes throughout the state. The imperial government um, uh, ran their own postal system in virtually every nook and cranny of India, including all these Indian feudatory states. So they had letterboxes strategically placed um, near, almost always near the state post offices, letter boxes, but they were in different colors so that, you know, it would be easy for somebody to realize it's an imperial letter box rather than a native state letter box. Uh, and people would sometimes use this, the, this imperial letter box to mail letters, typically going outside of, of their state which would only be hand, handled exclusively by the imperial postal system. Um, now, the only reason we have combination covers, combination covers meaning you have imperial stamps and the native state stamps is because the native postal system was much, much, much more elaborate than the imperial system. The imperial placed letter boxes or post offices strategically in big towns and big places. But when it came to remote areas, there was no postal service offered by the Imperial Post. So somebody posting a letter from a remote village to a destination outside his state into another state or another city uh, would have no choice but to frank their letter with not just the state post, postage stamps, but also the imperial because the state stamp would have to pay for the franking power to get it to the imperial exchange post office. And then from there on, the imperial post would deliver it to wherever it was going to. So going back, coming back to this letter, this letter was obviously, as we can see, it was franked with uh, state postage, 14 stamps. Um, it must have been a very heavy letter. But the sender accidentally dropped it in the uh, imperial letterbox. And the imperial postal service totally disregarded the franking for obvious reasons because they didn't get paid. It's not their stamps. So they charged, they levied a postage due of eight annas, which was a lot of money at the time. Uh, and so the, the recipient had to pay eight annas to get this letter. Um, and at some point, 
I would say this letter was handed back to what's really interesting about this letter is that eventually the state ended up delivering it because if you look at the dates, the imperial postmark is dated 20, uh, 25th September 84. No, I'm a little confused now myself about this. I'm gonna to have to do some more research on this because um, the explanation I've just given may be incorrect. The state post marks are dated 28th of September, whereas the imperial, uh, I'm going to come back to that. Let's let's skip this one. This um, I thought I had this all figured out, but maybe not. Continuing on with Indo, these are the um, so this issue was produced by Perkins Bacon. Um, the state sometimes used outside De La Rue and 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 some British printers to print their stamps. Um, this is the various stages of of, of the proof taken from the uh, master die. Uh, the word final is written on the stamp on the right with November 23rd. Here we have an artist essay of the one rupee denomination from that issue. It's hand painted in blue with a photograph of the Maharaja in the, in the center. If you'll remember, I talked about uh, Perkins Bacon uh, retaining one sheet of everything they produced. Um, well, I don't know if, if they did that for, for every colony and every country they printed stamps for, but at least when it came to Endor, they retained the first sheet, which has a serial number of triple zero on the top right-hand corner. And they perforated specimen and they kept in the archives. And the sheets were basically stamps of, this happens to be half a sheet. Uh, there were 80 stamps. Here we have a very interesting error. One sheet, on just one sheet, the uh, overprinting shifted to the top, creating the bottom stamp without an overprint. So th it's, there's only one of eight possible. How many have survived? I'm not quite sure. I have seen three examples so far in 35 years. Hopefully the other five have survived as well. Now we move on to Jaipur. This is um, a hand-drawn essay of the very first issue of Jaipur. I happen to like three color frankings or four color frankings. Uh, these are the three denominations that the first issue of Jaipur comprised of. Uh, we call them the litho lithograph issue of Jaipur, the first issue. Um, and this happens to be one of four known uh, co covers uh, bearing the all three denominations from the first issue. So these stamps are only known uh, perforated. However, I've discovered this copy and undoubtedly it's, it's roulette. So quite possibly an experiment that never materialized. Here we have the uh, unique sheet from the second printing, uh, from the second stone um, of the first issue. It's completely imperfect and it's quite possibly the only known complete sheet. Here we have a complete sheet of the one Anna, imperfect, uh, one of two known examples. And here we have a complete sheet, but printed in the color of two Annas. This is one Anna again, but it's, it's printed in the color of two Annas, which is emerald. And this is believed to be unique. Here we have a message and reply card of the very early 
issue of their proposed cards. Uh, this is believed to be one of three known. Here we have a re really interesting error. If you notice on uh, in the middle, it says Jaipur State, and then it says PSST card instead of POST postcard. It's a very famous error. Um, believed to be the only known unused example and less than 10 used examples are known. Now we come to an um, interesting issue where the postcards that were printed on paper that had a different color front and a different color back. Now the issued postcard is on the right hand side. Um, it was issued with the yellow front and green back. This is the only known example um, where it's printed on the reverse side. And then we have the same thing. This was also, this, these postcards were also issued with pink front and yellow back. And this happens to be the other way around. Now we move on to Jammu and Kashmir. Um, the ha this is the half anna denomination. The half anna, and this is uh, very, the blues, they come in four different shades, four different inks. I shouldn't call them shades. Four different blue inks were used at different times. <laughs> in the first issue of Jammu Kashmir. The um, royal blue happened to be the rarest color ink that was used. And only the one anna and the four annas are recorded in this color. This half anna is, has not been recorded thus far. This is, in my opinion, has to be the rarest stamp of Jammu and Kashmir. Now we come to the one anna again from the first issue of, of Jammu and Kashmir. This is the one anna in gray black, uh, SG4. All six recorded unused copies are cut to shape for some reason. The reason they used to cut them to shape is because to save on the weight of the letter because letters were charged based on weight. So they would often cut the stamps to shape just to shave on the weight of the letter. So we talked about six convention states. Well, in 1894, Jammu Kashmir had talks with the imperial government to become a convention state. Essays were produced, and this is what had Jammu and Kashmir become a convention state. This is most likely what their stamps would have looked like. Uh, it, on the top, it reads Kashmir in Devnagri, Hindi, uh, with the shield, with the state's shield, and the words Kashmir uh, in, in curved. And it didn't pan out. It didn't materialize. So. What ended up happening after 1894 is that the imperial government basically took over the postal department, postal service in the state of Jammu Kashmir. Uh, this happens to be the only, uh, the unique set in private hands. There's one other set in the Queen's collection, which actually happens to be less than uh, what I'm showing. I'm showing you 10 examples in the Queen's collection. I believe there's six of these 10 stamps in there. Now we move on to Jammu Kashmir telegraph stamps. Um, this is the only known proof impression taken on a piece of paper of two different denominations in their issued color. This, so that was the earlier design. Later on, they decided to have Dalaru print their telegraph stamps just like India uh, and have a vertical stamp which would be affixed on the telegraph forms in such a way that you could tear the form in half. The stamp would be placed in a special spot so as to have when you tear the receipt portion off of the telegraph form to give it to the sender, they would have a piece of the stamp would be on their portion of the receipt. So, so the 
so they would be basically separated in half. This is the unique unadopted essay uh, supplied by Delarue. Here we have, so there was, um, there was a shortage of the lower denomination stamps, uh, especially the half anna and the one anna and two annas. So they took some of the, now this was done locally, not in England. Uh, and they surcharged them. The one on the left is one of three known mint examples. The, one, the two on the middle and the right are the one of two known examples. Now we come to Jammu Kashmir uh, postcards. Uh, this happens to be printed on both sides and it's the only known example. Here we have a beautiful registered postcard um, from the first setting. Now there are several settings of this postcard. Uh, I won't get into the detail of that, but different papers, different uh, sizes and different settings. Quite. Um, can do quite a quite a nice little exhibit. Uh, here we have another example. Now this now we're moving on to Jastan State. Here's an interesting example. Again, the sender accidentally dropped this letter into the imperial letter box. The uh, three postmarks you see on this stamp. Uh, first of all, the stamp has been circled in red ink indicating that the stamp was not accepted for post, for post, as postage. Um, on the front of the cover, you see a postage due of three annas. Um, now, it's interesting, it must have weighed, Jastan only had one anna stamps. So the sender must have weighed it and perhaps thought he could get away by, may, by putting affixing just one Anna stamp, even though I'm assuming it weighed more than it weighed enough to require one and a half Annas, or, or maybe they, the state didn't have a rate of, of, you know, they allowed a heavier weight uh, for one Annas, but the Imperial Post had their own regulations. So based on the weight that it was determined to be, the um, postage amount should have been one and a half annas. And because it's deficiency, because it was unfranked, they charged twice of the um, rate, which ended up being three annas. So you can see this written three in red ink and annas, and that's the postage due that was charged. So the Imperial government ended up delivering this letter. Uh, oh. Let me just read this. Um, so let me just read this, what I've written now. Um, cover Frank with one on a perf 12, but actually posted in the Imperial letter box, which resulted in postage due in the amount of three annas. The accompanying note reads, the sender has applied a darbari tapal. Oh, so, so there's an explanation. The sender has applied a darbari tapal stamp. Darbari means state. Tapal is stamp and posted the letter in the Sarkari, Sarkari meaning Imperial Tapal box. The charge of three annas postman should be given from the office balance and the amount should be recovered from the addressee and deposited in the post office account. Here we have the uh, unique booklet containing 50 panes of that just and stamp we just saw. The panes are blocks of four, that's how they were issued. Here we have a combination cover from Jin State. Now Jin was also a, well, Jin was a feudatory state first, but at some point they joined the convention and then they became a convention state. But initially, this is from the earlier period, this cover is before they became a convention state. So this is a letter going from Jin State to Bombay and hence it has the half anna stamp to pay for the Imperial letter rate from Jin State to Bombay. The hard shape cancel was the only cancel that Jin State used to cancel their stamps. Here we have, uh, now we're moving on to Kishangar State. And uh, this is uh, the half an read from the second C issue. 
Uh, it's quite rare, maybe three or four used examples are known. Staying with Kishangar, here we have, now this was printed locally. This is proof taken uh, for the Pau Ana, Quarter Ana stamp. Um, this was printed by a company called Diamond Soap Works. <laughs> Don't know why they were called Diamond Soap Works, but um, that's the state press in Kishangar State. And this is from the first setting because the first setting was comprised of 10 examples. The second setting had 10 and another 10 side by side. Here's from the second setting, as you can see, there's uh, two vertical columns. Uh, this ha sheet happens to be completely imperfect. Uh, it's not yet listed in the catalog. Now we come to the state quota. Now quota is not listed in Stanley Gibbons. Um, hopefully someday soon it will be. This happens to be, there's only about nine, maybe, maybe no, I take it back. Um, in total, maybe, maybe 12 or 13 covers recorded from quota with bearing stamps, quota stamps. This is happens to be one of only two known quota covers bearing stamps that are uncanceled. So, and this was created by the postmaster, a very ingenious idea. He experimented with uh, creating stamps and, and what ended up what he ended up doing was um, he took the canceller. So if you look at the postmark on the right hand side, he basically took that device and removed the date slug, which is uh, um, which is actually the postmark is actually inverted as we are seeing it right now. So the date part slug is pointing towards the northeast right now. But he ended up removing the date slug, making impressions on colored paper with different color inks, and uh, cut them out and use them as stamps. And then he would initial them and uh, tie them to the cover. And those are his initials. And he would number them. There were serial numbers. Each stamp has had its own serial number. Um, Here's the only known quota exam stamp where the stamp is printed double. Now this one is properly canceled uh, with the black cancel on top of the stamp as well. And here's the other unused, uncanceled, I, sh I shouldn't say unused, that's the wrong word, uncanceled stamp of quota. And this happens to be the one passer stamp. All the other, all the other quota stamps are two passer. Uh, why this is one passer, uh, which it says that in in, in manuscript in black ink, um, I have no explanation. Uh, maybe a special rate. And here we have, so the first three we saw, those were all green ink on yellow paper. Now we have a black ink on yellow paper. And this happens to be one of four copies of the two pass of black on yellow. Now we move on to Morvey. Uh, this is an imperfect between from a unique sheet of eight. So only four possible pairs. Now we come to Nandgao. Nandgao, this is um, a registered cover. There's been a lot of debate. I, if you look at the cover, the stamps, uh, you see the initials in, in purple oval MBD, which was for the initials of the ruler of the king. Uh, the Stanley Gibbons and other catalogs consider this to be service stamps uh, with the initials MBD. I am not convinced that these are this is an service official cover. I believe like some of the other states like Dati and Dar, at some point, the state decided to put additional security markings on the stamps. Um, and that's what I believe this is. So I don't believe this is a service stamp, official stamp. It's just a normal stamp with 
with security seal. Here we have uh, one of two known covers, X have a back, um, both from his auction. Uh, it's certified as, it was sold as a used cover, but it's clearly philatelic in nature, but it still happens to be one of only two known. Now we come to this Orchard State. Um, this is the first issue mixed with the second issue. The second issue being the vertical pair on the right hand side. The red stamp is from the first issue. Here we have the only known sheet of the quarter anna uh, printed on late paper. And here we have an imperforate strip of three and a pair on registered cover. This issue, unfortunately, is not, for some strange reason, is not listed in Scott because um, used covers are mighty, mighty, mighty rare of this issue in period, in general. And perhaps that's why Scott doesn't list them, but they should be listed. They are known commercially used. Here we have a really interesting cover. Um, this is actually a cutout of the postal stationery envelope of Porsche, um, which in itself is the mighty rare item, um, believed to be maybe 10 to 12, a handful of uh, maybe a dozen or so main examples are known. And this is the only known cutout used um, as an adhesive. Now back to uh, Patiala, another convention state. Uh, convention state stamps are not as beautiful as, as appealing because they basically use the imperial stamps and just overprinted the state name and the logo or crest sometimes. But this is from the uh, proof sheet from the Delarue archives. And here we have the era where, again, the printing must have shifted upwards. Um, the bottom stamp without the old print. Here we have, now we move on to state Punch, which was which bordered Jammu Kashmir. This is the half an hour on orange buff wallpaper complete sheet from the uh, bottom left corner stamp has been added and it's, it's the only known example. So the dyes were defaced uh, so that, you know, Jammu and Kashmir had a big problem. The stamps, the dyes were used to, to reprint stamps and, um, and sell to unsuspecting collectors in Europe. So the, uh, in 1899, the um, Maharaja Poonch decided to have the stamps, the dies defaced. There were basically only four dies. And they took 10 impressions before the die was defaced in black ink and 10 impressions after they defaced the die. And if you notice the, the defacing is done on the, except for the die on the left where they nick a big chunk out of the, one of the sides, the other four dies, they basically crossed out and X'd out. These are again, all X fit stall. So Rajasthan state was formed after India became independent in 1947. And the stamps were only valid till about 1950 because um, uh, after that, the uh, Indian stamps, or these were all withdrawn and replaced with regular Indian stamps. Uh, so Rajasthan stamps are quite scarce to begin with. Few, few of the denominations are common. This is uh, the one rupee on Kishangar uh, hand stamp. It happens to be the largest known block. 
Now we come on, uh, come to Rajkot. Now Rajkot is the only Indian feudatory state that did not issue stamps, it only issued postal stationery. Now this happens to be a unique proof of the uh, postal stationery envelope printed on an inverted envelope. And this, so again, as a security marking, all Rajkot postal stationery was initialed by the magistrate of that time. So that bunch of different uh, signatures based on the different periods. Uh, this particular signature, it's possible that it, it's of a magistrate named I.K. Pandya, but it's the only known example. Now here we have a Rajkot postcard. It's interesting because you see the H.R. Bush, Butch, in diagonal and in script, it was hand stamped. So instead of signing as time went on, instead of the magistrates signing each and every mint card, postal station envelope or postcard, they came up with a hand stamp. And, and so later on, they started resorted to using hand stamps. So that's what, uh, that's the magistrates initials, HR Butch. Uh, what's interesting about this postcard is that the uh, sender has affixed a one anna uh, revenue stamp to pay for the application fee to have his court hearing date changed to a later date. It's the only such example that I'm aware of on, on Rajkot postal stationery. I've seen these on postal stationery from other states, including Morwe, but uh, this is the only one I've seen from Rajkot. Now we move on to Rajpipla. Um, Rajpipla issued letter sheets. This happens to be one of only two known commercially used letter sheets and sent to London. One paisa letter sheet. And it's got yeah. imperial ranking because uh, four and a half hours, uh, sorry. Five annas was the postal rate for letters at that time from India to England. So it's it's um, it's got the London paid on the on the front of the cover. And it's got the Bombay transit mark on the back of the cover. And here's that letter sheet. So th that letter sheet was issued in four denominations: one, two, three, and four pesa. Uh, this happens to be a complete sheet uh, from, must have been a very big lithographic stone because th that's a big sheet. Of course, I've reduced it, but um, I'd say it's about 20 inches wide by about, um, yeah, about 15 inches long. It's, it's a big sheet must have been a very big lithographic stone for them to have printed it the way they did. Uh, I need to be interrupt, but there are just 15 minutes left. So I just wanted to make you aware of that. Thank you. Thank you for that. I have, I, I've got only three or four, three more slides maybe. Um, so now we come to Rajpipla envelopes. This happens to be the unique example of the envelope printed on an inverted envelope. Uh, in total, no more than six Envelopes are known from Rajpipla State. That's how rare <laughs> Rajpipla envelopes are. Now we move on to Shapura State. This is one of two known covers, Frank, at the four pice rate. Each stamp is one pice. Uh, very crude. Uh, and this is the first stamp of Shapura. This happens to be ex fit style. Since I have, I might have a few minutes left. We'll talk about states like Dungarpur and Shapur in a little bit more detail because they have a really, really important his, uh, philatelic history, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Now we have a vertical strip of four of the uh, second stamp of Shapur. Uh, this is the um, one piece carmine on drab paper. This also is ex fritz stall. Fritz Stahl was the biggest collector of Shapura. Um, and uh, I was very lucky to acquire his, his collection uh, 
it's it's a actually very complicated story <laughs> someday. And here we have a block of four um, of the same stamp as she two cover. This cover is in really, really grubby shape, but uh, unfortunately this is all that exists. And here we have a strip of four of the SG4. This also is ex Fritz stall. It's the only known example of the 1921 one piece carmine drab strip four. And here we have one of two known combination covers of Shapura. This is this was actually the crystal one and a half receipt stamp that the state decided. Let me go back. So they, at some point, the state decided no point printing post post stamps for post postage. Let's just use the one and a half receipt stamp, which they've been printing for years. They actually printed for decades, for four decades. So they said, why bother printing the postage stamps? Let's just use the one and a half because the rates went up to one and a And at that point, they said, We'll, we'll just use these, the one and a stamp. So these are called postal fiscals uh, when they use postally. And this, what makes it really, really pretty is that the crested postal stationery, not postal stationery, the crested stationery that was used, which is the same design as the stamp. Unfortunately, you can't see much of the stamp design, but over here, because it's uh, the big black oval cancel, but that is the same design of the stamp as that is on the stationery. And then again, there was shortage of stamps for a short period of time. Um, and this happens to be one of two known covers where the state allowed the four Anna court fee stamps to be used for postage. By this time, the rate had gone up to four Annas. Uh, the rate jumped from one Anna to four Annas, uh, big jump. Oops. Now we come to Sir Moore. These are the uh, progressive dye proofs that were produced by Waterloo. So Waterloo produced these stamps for, for Sir Moore State. Beautiful elephant stamps. And here's the um, proofs from the stone. These were all printed from lith lithographic stones. And here's the unique example of the um, elephant stamp, the six pies, uh, imperf between. What's really interesting is at some point, I believe after, and this happened after the state post shut down and was taken over by the imperial government, that there was a lot of demand for stamps from Europe at that time, for Indian state stamps, especially Indian princely state stamps. So, and of course, uh, there was demand for official stamps. I, I believe all the Bundi stamps that are all printed service were done on, on because of huge demand for service stamps, official stamps in Europe. I don't think, and there's not a single cover known Frank with Bundi service stamps because that by that time, by the time those service stamps were issued, official mail did not require any franking. So these stamps were created strictly for collectors. Um, I believe these thermo stamps, uh, the same thing happened. I think shortly after the close of the, uh, the thermo postal system, there was demand from Europe for official stamps. And so they overprinted on SSS, on thermo state service. Not, it's not very clear because it's in black, but um, hopefully you can make out some of the letters on SSS. Um, so this, now we're moving on to Surat state in Gujarat. Uh, this is the unique example of SG-015. Um, 015 is, is a mighty, mighty rare stamp to begin with. Maybe one of four exam mint copies are known. But this is what's really interesting about this is this is... Um, it's been written, canceled, and signed by the postmaster. Uh, and this was found in their archive. Somebody has relieved the Sorat archive of these precious stamps at some point. 
but this was in the Surat archives at one point. Now we come to another state that is called Tonk that's not listed by Stanley Gibbons. It's, it's listed in Scott. Now this is the first essay. This is an essay of the first stamp that was prepared, but not issued in 1897. This is lithograph. So all, this, all 12 examples are slightly different because they're hand, hand engraved each one on a lithographic stone. And here we have one of three known covers from Tong. That's it, three stamps on three covers. That's it, that's all that's known from Tong. And here, just for fun, uh, here we have one of the stamps. Let me see which uh, left column. Second from the bottom stamp says A A N A instead of Anna A N N A, and that's it. So, if I have a couple of minutes, I, I'd, I'd like to talk about. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted to give a little bit background on um, three or four states: Dungarpur, Shapura, Kota, and Tong. None of these states were known to have issued stamps till the 1970s, even though they issued stamps in the 19th century in some cases. And the reason being is because no combination covers were known. So the mail stayed within the state and nobody was really, nobody was aware of the fact that these states even issued their own stamps, let alone have their own postal system. Well, maybe they, they were aware they had their own postal system, but they didn't, because there's a lot of states that had their own postal system, but never issued stamps. Uh, they had private carriers or, 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 or the mail was exclusively for official purposes and there was no charge. So it was, in, but in these four states, we, the world wasn't, the philatelic world wasn't aware of the fact that these states issued stamps. It just so happened by pure accident when the state archives were being sold off, um, we have in near Jaipur, near Jaipur, there's a small uh, area, I forget the name of it, but that's where bulk of the Indian uh, paper manufacturing takes place. So what would happen is uh, the recyclers would go and buy out the entire stock of whatever was in, in, in archives and they would take it, they would transport it to oh the state this the city is called Sanganer near in Jaipur. And so they would take it to Sanganer, sell it to paper manufacturers and would turn it into pulp. And um, most likely that's what would have happened with all these four states had it not been for the shrewd eye of one or two paper guys in Sanganer that said, wait a minute, these have stamps on them. So they must have some value. They must be worth more than just scrub paper. Uh, and that's how these things were saved. So, and these, did, uh, these states did not get listed um, till the 19, late eighties in catalogs. And that's, all I have for today, uh, let me just stop.